This lecture is supposed to be on keeping jazz alive on Cape Cod. So uh, let's start off with giving you three names. Roger, Judy, Day. Because they're arts Falmouth, they're jazz has Falmouth, and without them, none of this would be happening. So talk about keeping jazz alive, at least in Falmouth, they've done a great job. It's been my pleasure to work with them for many years, both as a board of director member for the Arts Foundation and performing many times for Arts Falmouth, including opening act for uh, Grace, uh, and, uh, and we also did, uh, we've done Arts Falmouth many times. Um, so in fact, last year we did the dance last summer. I don't know if anybody was there for that, but uh, we had a great time. Anyway, um, so what I wanted to do was a couple things. First of all, um, this, there's a big thing push around the United States now. It's called Made in America, bring our jobs back and those kind of things. Well, Made in America, that's what jazz is. And as somebody who's run a jazz festival for almost 12 years now, up in the other end of the Cape, Provincetown and Catuit, I can tell you that our number one export to the world is jazz. You can go anywhere in the world and hear jazz. And I've had artists from South America, from Canada, throughout the United States, Europe, Asia, uh, Russia, contact me about performing jazz on Cape Cod. These are jazz musicians who not only want to make a living playing jazz, but who know the music really well, and they support the music really well. So I maintain that our number one export the United, from the United States to the world is jazz. And, um, you know, the one thing about jazz is we have to look at the history. And the history of jazz came out of slavery. Because when the slaves were in the field, they could not communicate, they could not talk. Because if they, if they spoke to each other, they could be killed. Okay, certainly beaten, but could be killed. So what they did was they came up with a communication, and they started singing back and forth. And what they would sing is, they would sing their thoughts back and forth about what's going on, what they're going to do. I'm going to meet you at the river tonight at 8, I'll be there, back and forth communicating. And... Um, and actually, that's one of the traditions we've kept in jazz. Tonight, you'll hear these young kids play tonight, and they're going to trade fours. Somebody will play four, somebody will play four. The other night in rehearsal in see jazz in uh, Orleans, we had the guitarist who's going to be here tonight, and the sax player is going to be here tonight. And they started trading back and forth. But what they did is not just traded, they communicated. And everybody in the room felt it. And then we had them communicate faster and faster, from four bars to two bars to one bar to playing together. It was amazing communication. So that's the history, the bad history of slavery, good history of the music. The other thing that's unique to this music in the United States is that slaves were not allowed to have rhythm instruments, percussion instruments. Because if you go to Africa, if you go to Cuba, if you go to South America, the drum is the main thing. And I say this as a drummer, okay? But I also say it as a, as a student, uh, person who studies different cultures and different kinds of music. So when the slaves came here and they didn't have these drums, what could they do? They started communicating by means of melody. And that's really where jazz got its start, was a melody. Then the rhythm came into that. So that's why jazz is so unique in the United States. It doesn't sound like Afro-Cuban that we hear down music in Cuba. It doesn't sound like what we hear in Africa. It's a very unique music. And what's cool is it went back to these different parts of the world and it really caught on. And um, the really pushing, who was pushing all of this is Dizzy Gillespie. He would go out as a cultural ambassador for the United States and show them what we were doing, okay, throughout the different periods. And as you look at the different periods, we were talking about this earlier, throughout the United States, as we came out from the 1800s into the 1900s, we started getting into things like ragtime and blues but then we started getting into the swing era. And from the swing era, we started going from there into different parts of jazz, bop, uh, free jazz, smooth jazz, and on. So what's happened with jazz is jazz has been this, as Whitney Marcellus says, a big house. And what I try to do with the kids when we work with the C Jazz group you'll hear later is make sure that they understand that, but more importantly, that they play something from each of the traditions. Swing jazz, more modern jazz, a waltz, Okay, something that's a Latin. So they're keeping the tradition alive of playing all kinds of different parts of jazz and bringing it out into what they're doing performance-wise. Um, before I talk about Cape jazz history, 
and then start talking about what we're doing today, because the Cape has a rich history of jazz. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about my background. And usually you see a snippet, or if you go to my website, you see a bio and that kind of thing. But let me give you just a little bit more information. I'm late to music. I started when 13, going on 14. Uh, up until that point, I really didn't know about music. I mean, I went to a couple, I grew up in Washington, D.C., and my grandparents would take me to see the symphony. My parents didn't have any music going on in the house. Nothing was happening. And occasionally my brother would put on some rock and roll. He's a couple years older. He's deceased now, but he's a couple years older than me. And, you know, that kind of thing would happen. But So the first thing I did was pick up an electric bass, and my, my fingers were just too short. Now, my nephew and my brother in Paris, they both have fingers like this, like Patrick here is going to play for you later. He has much bigger. I put my fingers up to his, and he's still growing. He's 13. His fingers are already bigger than mine. And that really makes a difference. Now, now they have these smaller basses, but... I knew that wasn't right, so I, I saw the kids in the school playing drums, and I decided to try that. And I have these, you know, what, I have a lot of padding on my hands, so it worked out really well. And when my wife was going through foot surgery, she's an artist on the Cape, they were, the doctors were complaining about how thin her foot is. I have a lot of padding on my feet. So it worked out really well for me that I had a good mus muscular structure, my hands and feet, perfectly for the drum set. And what I also noticed is when I started playing drums, I excelled. I was in junior high when I started playing. We had 12 percussionists. I ended up being their section leader. We went to high school. I ended up being their section leader. And then I started taking it very seriously. I studied with the percussionist, the principal percussionist from the National Symphony. I was a protege. Principal timpanist of the National Symphony. I was a protege. And I decided to graduate high school early and go to a very good college that we had in Maryland called Montgomery College, which was like a mini Berkeley. Um, we had Bill Potts, who was arranging for Buddy Rich. We had luminaries coming through all the time. I got to play with Bill Woods. I got to play with Ernie Wilkins. And uh, you get to play with some great people. And back then, with Richie Cole. And um, what I found very quickly was, even though I was studying all these percussion instruments and I was really good at it, the drum set was really my thing. And I was very fortunate because in D.C. at this time, we had two jazz stations. We had jazz stations at night where you could hear all kinds of jazz. Um, Felix Grant, who was known from everybody there for playing all kinds of different kinds of jazz, but he would go out to places like Chicago and St. Louis and find people like me who were just in these places and grab their CDs and bring them back and educate people in DC about them. And then we had Paul Anthony, who was a radio and television personality, but he would start education, educating us in the 70s on Miles Davis and what he was doing. So when I went to see Miles Davis at Howard University, he had a 13-piece band, you know. The reason his back was to you is because he was conducting this band, like I'm going to do tonight. I'll have my back to you the whole night, because we'll have six or seven people up here. And, and what was happening with that? So it was great education. And I started playing jazz in the clubs. And then an opportunity came my way. Um, I auditioned for New England and Conservatory Music and for Juilliard, and got accepted to both. But the Air Force Band had an opening. And the opening was for a quartet, guitar, piano, bass, and drums. And the group only played in the Washington, D.C. area and never traveled, ever. The group used to travel, but a general called up and wanted the diplomats to play a party. And they said, oh, sir, he's, they're in Ohio. That's it. They're never traveling again. <laughs> so for five years, I was in the Air Force Band as the youngest technical sergeant in the entire world because I was so young. And um, I beat out everybody for that job. And for five years, I got to play at the White House, Vice President's House, parties, and we had a ball. And we just, we had a great time. And when I left, the band was disbanded, and I got into computers during the day and played at night. And I continued to play big band, small band. In the 90s, I got into the jazz clubs more and more, started playing what is now called smooth jazz, but back then it was fusion. And when I came up to the Cape, I didn't know what to expect. That was 12 years ago. We'll stop right there for a minute. So, the Cape Jazz history, and I didn't know this until I got here, okay? This place has a rich history of jazz, and I'll just talk about the other part of the Cape for a second, because Falmouth is speaking for itself right now, in tonight. Um, Provincetown, when Billie Holiday lost her cabaret card, and you needed a cabaret card to play in New York, she lost it. Guess why? And the A-House, 
which at the time was a place you could play music in Provincetown. And Reggie Cabral invited her to play there. Miles Davis was there with a 17-year-old Tony Williams. I mean, this is incredible history. Later on in the 70s, Dizzy Gillespie came, and so on. In the 50s, we had a club in Harwich called Storyville. Now, a lot of you know Storyville because it was also in Boston. And it was owned by two gentlemen, one of which is Paul Nossiter, who still plays clarinet on Cape Cod. And the other one is George Ween, who invented the jazz festival and is still alive. Um, and then, in the 70s and 80s, in Yarmouth, we had what is called the Columns. And I get to work all the time with Ron Ormsby. We're working tomorrow. And he was one of the owners of the Columns. And there you could hear anybody, Maynard Ferguson, you name it. Um, luminaries on the piano. Dave McKenna, okay, Marie Marcus, and uh, who I got to work with before he died, Eddie Higgins. So, great jazz on the Cape. This is a tradition on the Cape. So when I came up, and my wife and I moved here, she's an artist, and we moved to Provincetown, and then three years ago we moved to Orleans, I figured, I didn't know anything. I figured I'd be playing a bunch of golf courses, you know. That's, that's what I figured would happen. And there really wasn't much of a jazz scene. So what you can do is you can sit home and you can wait for the phone to call or you can make the phone call, okay, and make it happen, okay. And as they say in sales, there's those people who, you know, make it happen and people wonder how did that make it happen. Well, I just happen to be one of those people basically who, just, who makes it happen. And maybe it was my background in business and music in D.C., but anyway, um, First thing I started doing was playing a jazz gig up in Provincetown at a place that no longer exists called Clement Ursi's. And it became the place in Provincetown on Friday night where people would come and hear jazz. And I was very fortunate because there was a woman who just retired as a singer on Cape Cod after 25 years. Her name is Carol Wyeth. And I met Carol when I was doing a gig in Provincetown in one restaurant in the summer. I just moved there and she was doing it at the other end. She double parked, which is a big deal in Provincetown, came in, sang two songs with me contacted me and we stayed friends ever since. And she gave me her list of musicians, which was like this. Within six months, I was in the food store getting calls from musicians saying, I need a pianist, who do I call, that kind of thing. So it was building the network of musicians on Cape Cod. And then, uh, working on a condo in the winter, I decided, this was 2005, <coughs> decided that uh, we could probably use a jazz festival. And um, looked at uh, the model of Newport, saw that it wasn't going to work, and um, please, come on in. Oh, oh, okay, oh, oh, okay. Oh, oh. No, please interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> so, looked at, uh, we had this beautiful town hall, and uh, decided to do the first year of the Provincetown Jazz Festival. Over the past 12 years, we moved into Katuit for the last five years. We finally moved to a new venues um, in Provincetown at the uh, Crown and Anchor, where people can buy alcohol, because I was tired after 10 years of people saying, can I buy a drink, can I buy a drink? <laughs> and, uh, and we knew we were going to fill town hall and didn't have great sound. So now that's firmly established. That's great. The next thing I did after that was to start a music series at the Provincetown Art Association. If you've never been to the Art Association, you need to go. It's absolutely beautiful. It, we're, Provincetown is the oldest continuous arts colony in the United States. Okay, It's all on Cape Cod, I'm telling you, it's right here. And, and just the, the history is so rich. It's where American theater started. Eugene O'Neill penned his first play in Provincetown. Okay, this is amazing history right here on the Cape. So we started that, we just finished our 10th year. Okay, it's a great series. We do that during the summer. Um, at the movie Down the Cape at the Wealthy Harbor Actors Theater, we're now in our fourth year of the music festival there. Um, and uh, we brought some great jazz there, including Stage Door Canteen from Falmouth up there, which they very rarely get to perform on the Outer Cape. So what's happening is we're bringing jazz from Falmouth up to there and jazz from there up down here. So we're crossing already, okay? And this is part of keeping jazz alive. It's not just, I'm going to stay here, you're going to stay here. It's moving around, getting people to know each other. Um, then I wanted to find a place in Hyannis that I was ready to go down there. He'd make the trip from Provincetown to Hyannis, no problem. So, you know, Columbo's had a great scene, and, and we all know Lou passed away a couple years ago, but David's kept that going. Um, 
I kept going by this place called the Cape Cod Resort, and I noticed that it said jazz, Fridays and Saturdays. So I contacted them, and, um, and I said, I'm really interested in, in playing. So I came in there, and after a year, I really got, and this is beautiful room, it, it's it, no cover, it's a wine bar, it has great food. So what I've established there over the past couple years, I've been there five years, is we have a, a, basically a, a foundation of a singer, Leslie Boyle, who comes in once a week, uh, once a month, I'm sorry. Then we have a smooth jazz group, and I'll talk about that in a minute. The smooth jazz is a great way to introduce people who say, I don't like jazz to jazz. <laughs> and and as, when I say smooth, just take the title for a second, we do all kinds. And, um, and then two guest artists a month. And uh, one of our guest artists is sitting back here, D uh, Dennis Flaherty, amazing singer. He's going to be singing pretty soon. And, um, and we bring them in from New York and Boston and Philadelphia, and we just brought in somebody from Virginia. And the Cape Codder give me a, gives me rooms. So all of a sudden, we have guest artists coming in from all over. And what this has done is it's introduced Cape Cod to new musicians. But more importantly, it's giving these people an avenue to say, hey, I'm kind of trying out for jazz festivals. OK. Because when Roger and Judy are looking for performers, they'll say, hey, I saw you had so-and-so. What do you think? Or these guys will say to me, and some of these people have gone on to perform at the Provincetown Jazz Festival. <laughs> Bless you. Another thing the Provincetown Jazz Festival did was, the second year, I'm, I'm, I love to improvise. If you come hear me at the Grand Carew, the sets are never the same. Everything's always different. It's in jazz format. But what I'm saying to you is that the singers don't know what they're going to sing. It's totally improvised. Okay. And this goes on for an hour and a half, and it's great. So it's in true jazz format. Okay. We're not playing the same way, the same song every time. So the second year of the Jazz Festival, I said, well, we need to expand to three days. I've since contracted back to two days because I found that a daytime during August does not work. Okay, But we tried. So what happened is we did a jazz jam in 2006. And 40 professional jazz musicians came to Provincetown in August, not paid. Okay. Now, I didn't know what a big deal that was. I said, man, this sounds cool. I, now, I've learned many years now what that meant, and, and the sacrifice, and the time, and everything else, and the energy. They all came, they had a ball. We had two sets. It was great. Since then, we've done the Jazz Jam every month since. And that's how I've met some amazing players. I'll give you an example. The Jazz Jam is it's the only Jazz Jam on Cape Cod. It's called Jazz Jam Cape Cod. It's now going to be in Yarmouth. It just moved to Hyannis. Our venue just closed. So we're moving to Riverway in Yarmouth this month. And um, one day, the jazz team, you never knew it was going to show up because we had Fred Boyle on piano, Ron Armsby, who not only owned the columns, he was Marie Marcus's piano bass player for 20 years, and myself. And I host, but we have people come in and sit in all the time. So one day, a guy walks in, older gentleman, has a clarinet, licorice stick, and he says, I want to sit in. Fine. So he sits in. After a couple beats, you just know that this is a special gentleman. And I said to him afterwards, now, he didn't introduce himself, he just started playing. And I said, I said, what is your name? He says, my name is Joe Moraney. And I said, okay. He says, look me up on Google. Google. So I got to Google him. First picture that comes up on Google is Joe Moraney with Louis Armstrong. He was the last clarinetist to play with Louis Armstrong. So I called Joe and I said, Louis, he says, yeah. And I said, and I, he told me he lives in New York, and he goes to Hungary, and he goes back and forth. He was a national treasure, I said was. National treasure in Hungary. Um, so I said, hey, I'd like for you to play the Province Not Jazz Festival. And thank God he did, because he passed away a couple years later. Mm. He was very concerned about the trumpet player we were going to use. And one of the groups I'm in is called the Cape Cod Jazz Quintet. And Steve Ahern is first called trumpet player in Florida. But Joe didn't know who Steve was. So Steve repeated Joe. He went on the bandstand that night, played a couple notes, played a little bit more. Joe looked at me and smiled. And I know that he was very happy. Because I kept telling him, don't worry, Steve's great. And Steve's played with Aretha Franklin, Diane Carroll, it's amazing. So, um, so that's the jazz jam. Coming down the cave, we started working at venues like the Cultural Center in Yarmouth, producing concerts year-round the Katuit Center for the Arts, and 
Then came the last couple years, which was the major calling for me. Um, before I talk about education, I'll tell you a little bit more about performance. So you can catch me playing regular jazz, like tonight. You can catch me playing smooth jazz, the Cape Cod Jazz Quintet, which I put together four years ago, which is an amazing group. Bruce Abbott on sax, Ron Armsby, Fred Boyle, and myself. And we've recorded, the music has been played in South America. We played a couple of Brazilian pieces on the CD, our CD, and gotten thumbs up from people down in Brazil. Um, and the smooth jazz group, this is the one I love, because I will have young kids who come to me and say, I don't like jazz. Say, so come to a smooth jazz gig, concert, whatever. We just did our last outdoor concert. And it's amazing, because all of a sudden, within a couple numbers, they'll hear some 70s fusion, they'll hear some what is considered to be smooth jazz now, because we play traditional smooth jazz now. Play some swing, we'll play some Latin. Um, we just did this huge event for the Cape Cod Young Professionals, the three of us, at the Retrix Hangar. You might have read about it on the front page of the paper. 700 people there. Some dancers wanted to dance, so we had to pick pieces they could dance to, all different styles. And everybody got to see that this is something, wow, this is great music. So I'll say to these people, now that you like this, now come out and listen to some standards, traditional, you know, the Great American Songbook. Um, education. This is the biggest thing. I, 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 was, I was an educator in Washington, D.C. I taught for the D.C. Youth Orchestra. I taught for the Capitol Hill Arts Workshop. And I have private students. And when I got into the business world, I put that aside. And when I came to the Cape, I said, I'm not going to do education. My wife said, what about it? No, not doing it. She was a school teacher in college. And she said, you're going to do it? No, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. So I started teaching some private students about three years ago. And then the Cape Conservatory called me up. And the director, Dr. Stephanie Weaver, said, we want to start a, C -jazz, a, con a, a conservatory jazz program, which we're going to call C-Jazz, Conservatory Jazz. And we'd like for you to start that. So at the same time, Sturgis called me, and they wanted to be their jazz band director. And I said, I can't do it. I'm sorry. I've already made a commitment. So I, that fall, I went to work for the conservatory. Since then, we had the C-Jazz program up and running in Falmouth, in Barnstable, in Orleans. We just started intro to see jazz, okay? I'm teaching privately with them. Last December, I got a call from Sturgis East again on Main Street, and they said, um, we'd like for you to come down and talk to us. And basically, the interview was, you're taking the job. <laughs> uh, I can tell you this morning at 7.30, I was down on Main Street High S, teaching my improvisational group, which is very similar to see jazz, and they were having a ball. Last, this past Wednesday, I had my big band, it's my first big band ever. I'm very emotional about this stuff because I feel great. And every year the kids are just wonderful, you know. Are these the best jazz players in the world? No. But do they have fun and do they gel? Absolutely. It's great. Sea jazz is another story. You're in for a treat tonight. Um, then, last but not least, I'll tell you about my baby. This is something I've wanted to do for many, many years. It's called Bringing Jazz Education into the Schools. And a lot of people have talked about it, a lot of people have done it, but not a lot of people have brought jazz into the schools on Cape Cod. And how best to keep jazz alive, but giving it to the next generation and the generation below them. And I'm not talking about the musicians. I'm talking about the average person, the average young kid, the average, I went to play for Barnstable and Immediate the other day, 600 sixth graders, okay? And when they come in the room, we play chameleon. And when we play Chameleon, they look at us, because it's by Herbie Hancock, we'll play it tonight. And they say, this isn't jazz. And we'll say, yes, it is. And then we take them back to the 20s and the 30s and 40s. And along the way, we'll play something like Summertime. Four different ways. As a waltz, as a slow piece, as a fast swing, and as a Latin. Just a little snippet. And we'll make them vote. Can you imagine 600 sixth graders deciding which way the band's going to play it. Every single time they want us to play it as a lab. It's great. Throughout the whole Cape, we've done this. And we're going to continue to do it. And it's giving it to them. So maybe it's a couple songs on their iPod. Maybe it's, hey, mom, I want to go hear a jazz group. Maybe it's just keeping jazz alive. Or maybe it's watching Star Trek's The Next Generation and watching 300 Years in the Future, somebody playing trombone, playing jazz, and watching that as my age and saying, I hope that's the case. I hope jazz does stay alive. because. It's a great American art form. It's improvisational. And it really what makes us, you know, 
you look at where the, all the tech companies are coming out of in the world, and they're coming out of here. Why? Because we have the spirit of improvisation, and that's what jazz is. It's improvisation. And the songs these kids are going to play tonight hopefully will be different every time you hear them, and that's what makes it you know, unique. And uh, So that's pretty much my remarks. I figured before we wrap up that I would answer any questions that you had. Um, hopefully you have a few. And um, please. Come on, one or two. Go ahead. <laughs> Don't be afraid. Don't be shy. Yes? Who's your favorite jazz musician of all time? I, I can't or say that. It's so ten. subjective. How many? How about ten? Ten. ten. <laughs> drummers? Yeah. Ten drummers. Ten drummers? <laughs> well, I know. I'll give you ten musicians. Let's see. No. Um, it's certainly Miles Davis. Okay, because I got to see Miles. You know what he did in the 50s? You know, Miles still has the number one recording of all time, kind of blue. So Miles Davis. Um, Herbie Hancock, who I was just at his birthday party at 75th in Boston. Um, I love Herbie. I'm a big fan. Um, I, I love Art Blakey because he ran this thing called the Jazz Messengers and brought these kids through there. And he would say to Herbie Hancock or whoever was in the band at the time, uh, Freddie Hubbard, okay, go write a tune, bring it in next week. And then when that person got good enough, he says, you're out of the band, you're fired. Go start your own band. And, he's, and that was his school. And, and Whit Marcellus was one of the graduates of that school. Um, Duke Ellington, not only because he was from DC, but because Duke, just most beautiful music, you know? Um, I know I'm gonna miss a few, but uh, um, I got to see Count Basie and Oscar Peterson play together. Oscar Peterson and Count Basie. Count Basie kept up note for note. That guy with that little chubby fingers, you should have seen him, it was amazing. That <laughs> um, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say Buddy Rich. Um, he, I, I got to see Buddy three times and he just, just blew me away every time. You know? oh. Best drummer I've ever seen. Um, my favorite drummer probably is Bobby Durham, who a lot of people don't know, he died. Um, he was Fest Story, Sean Montero, who I work with a lot on the Cape. Sean comes from Rhode Island. She teaches at the Hart School of Music. She's a goddess in Italy. Her father was the bass player for Duke Ellington. Um, her godmother was Sarah Vaughn. Her godfather just passed away, Clark Terry. And we were sitting there eating between, a, we were, she was playing my concert series up in Provincetown one year. We're eating lunch. And I, she said, who's your favorite drummer? And I said, I really, really Bobby Durham. And she dropped her fork and she said, Bobby's been my drummer for 14 years in Italy. Mm -hmm. So, the year later, we dedicated the Provincetown Jazz Festival to Bobby. Um, I could go on. There's so many. Yeah. What did you think of the movie Whiplash? I did not see Whiplash for three reasons. One is because I, I don't have fingerprints on some of my fingers because my fingers did bleed growing up. Mm -hmm. I did have a college professor. I was in college a year early because I graduated high school early who yelled at me. Didn't throw anything at me, but he did yell. And as an educator, I cannot think of doing anything but smiling and giving great music to these kids. I used to have a guy go to my music stable. <laughs> so, so you know. And, and, and there are two C-Jazz students sitting right here from Falmouth, so I can't imagine ever throwing anything at it. I mean, I could be a little hard, right, Nico? I could be tough, right? I could be tough. Until I practice it. Until you practice it. practice it. And what does practice mean? No, more practice, right? Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, yes. With the improvisation, I, I with the students that I taught, I tried to uh, stress and indicate to them that they actually are co-composers with the music that, that's part of the improvisation process. Um, when I tell them that, and they begin, the light goes on. Yes. It's a, oh, really? And yes. Alan Klinger is one of our professors, one of our teachers at the C Jazz program, and he teaches intro to C Jazz, and he also teaches a theory class. He, he has this great saying, he says, every time you improvise, you're creating a new melody. Okay. And, um, you know, from a drummer's perspective, it's very tough because you can only do rhythm. Okay. You don't have the notes at your disposal. So it's even more difficult. But what's really cool is when you're trading fours with somebody giving them ideas rhythmically, because usually the performer on their instrument, the two things are gonna separate is one is if they can use the rhythm, or two if they can hold notes out or things like that, the phrasing, because we get paid for the notes we don't play. So, 
Uh, but but improv improvisation is, you know, that's, um, I, I work with a klezmer group on the Cape that plays klezmer and swing. And one of the reasons I love working with that group is because our violinist and our clarinetist, when he sits in, they both improvise. And that's what the nature of the music was, was improvisation. And that's why klezmer musicians make great swing musicians, because they already knew how to improvise. It's the same set of skills you've got, you know, pretty much what happens is when you're playing a jazz piece like tonight, these kids will have, here's, here's how it goes, here's the roadmap, go off and improvise and come back, okay? And it's what they do with this part of it that makes it totally unique and different every time. Yeah. So Dizzy was on the Cape in the 70s? Yes, Dizzy was at Provincetown Town Hall. Mm -hmm. They used to have uh, hospital balls here in Palma and uh, at the Armory, and Dizzy Gillespie played one year. As a matter of fact, he was supposed to be there at 9 o'clock. No Dizzy Gillespie. 10 o'clock. No Dizzy Gillespie. <laughs> 10.30 he comes in, he went right by my table. He said, I must have come by way of Detroit. What he, <laughs> what, what he did is he went to Plymouth instead of Falmouth. Oh. Someone <laughs> sent him to Plymouth instead of Falmouth. That's a great story. Wow. Mm. That's good. That's yeah, great. He, so he played until 2 o'clock in the morning. What year was that? It was in the 1970s. Uh, I'm not quite sure of the year. I got. The, I still have the program. And that was in Falmouth. In Falmouth at the Armory. Wow. That's where we used to have the uh, hospital balls. That's great. Every year, like we had the Light Miller Orchestra. We had uh, all the big ones. That's great. Guy yeah. Lombardo played three times. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Ron tells me when he owned the columns that you know. I mean, you 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 just look at the musicians who came through there. And then I saw a program recently from the 50s, early, late 50s, early 60s, from, you know, uh, from George Wing's place and uh, Storyville on the Cape. And, and the musicians who came through there, and you go, oh my god. I mean, Gene Krupa, everybody, you know, came through there. All the big names. I saw Earl Father Hines there. See? A couple of times. And that's Harwich. That was Harwich. <laughs> yeah. And you had to, you know, do you know, what's interesting is, he had to become a member. That's the way it was set up. You became a member, you know, like you paid a buck. I don't know what it was. But that's the way they got around some of the rules. It was very interesting. Yes, sir. Question, and maybe Al or somebody else. What was Molly's Black Cat like? I think that burned just before we came to town in the 80s. But they used to say that Dave McKenna and all kinds yeah. of good jazz people played there. It's over on Depot Avenue by what's now the bus station. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wasn't that I, supposed to be a pretty good jazz place? They played there, yeah. That was good. Yeah. Uh, there was another one in Hyannis too that that closed up, and then the Roadhouse replaced them. And I don't remember the name of that. It was before I got there too. So, uh, one last question. Yes. Oh, if I might. Uh, Brazilian jazz. You yes. Touched on that a little bit. Um, you mentioned kids. Great introductions to jazz. One they're probably not familiar with. Vince Giraldi played the music for Peanuts. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, all of those. Um, but uh, there's some great Brazilian jazz here in the too, right? Yes. Um, Fred Boyle loves playing one that we do now. Um, it's um, uh, Ginza Samba. And we'll play that for people, whether we're at a wedding or a private event or whatever, because we do do private events, of course, too. And by the way, I should, I'd be remiss without saying I do have a mailing list that goes out. If you're not on the mailing list, you want to get on that, let me know because it tells you about jazz all across the Cape. Um, but Ginza Samba is one of those, and we love playing it because Ginza Samba, what you have to know about Vince Guaraldi was, in the 50s, San Francisco was a jazz hub. And he was there, and he was writing this music. This is before Charlie Brown. So what we'll do is we'll play Ginza Samba, and I don't think I have it for you, I play it, and, um, and watch people's eyes. Especially when we play it in concert, we'll say, sounds really familiar, and everybody will go, yeah! And we'll go, Charlie Brown, and they'll go, yeah, that's it! <laughs> um, so what happened is, um, three gentlemen went to Brazil, as the story goes. Uh, it was Charlie Bird, who was a guitarist from Washington, D.C., who a friend of mine played drums with till he passed, Charlie that has passed. Uh, Keeter Betts, who I used to play bass with, he was the last 24 years with Ella Fitzgerald as a bass player. So. And he taught me how to back singers. And then Stan Getz. And they went down to Brazil, 
And they came back, and for a year, Keeter said, we've got to record this stuff, we've got to record this. They finally did. Of course, the rest is jazz history. Um, one of the, the, the very famous ones with uh, Antonio Carlos Jobim, who's the most well-known composer, but not the only composer to come out of Brazil, is uh, one with Frank Sinatra. It's a great album. But anyway, so what we did was we infused bossa and we infused samba into jazz music. And what's great about this music, and um, it's, it's uh, James Taylor was just talking about this, by the way, on Tavis' Smiley Show. Um, and what he was talking about was the melodies. We're back to the melodies, okay? Not just the rhythm that we think of the bosses and the sambas, but the music, the, the melodies, the harmonies that we brought in that, uh, you know, uh, Johnny Alf, who wrote the first the bossa nova, and, and other people brought in. So, why, did, why is this really cool? Because the song they're going to play tonight is called Song for My Father. You're going to play that tonight? Did you know? Anyway, and that song was written in the United States based on this music. So it's come kind of full circle. And, and that's one of the songs. So we're educating the kids not only about the beats, the bosses, the sambas, but bringing it into you know, the music and letting them explore that. And there's a lot of great music at the Provincetown Jazz Festival last year, this past summer, we brought up our first South American musician, Fabiano de Castro, and he performed his original Brazilian compositions, jazz compositions. But there's, there's a lot of you know, great jazz on the Cape, a lot of Brazilian jazz. Livio Freitas lives here. Um, he's performing tonight. And, and if, there are, if, if you come to one of my gigs, usually the first song I'll call off is a bossa nova. So it means a lot to me. It was my dad's favorite song before he passed away. It was Way, which was written by Antonio Carlos Giovini. So that's, that's a great question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to move the podium. We're going to start setting up. And we're going to perform as soon as we uh, get ready here about 6.45. So relax, enjoy, and we'll be back with some music.